Robert Shear is the author of They Know Everything About You, How Data Collection, Corporations, and Snooping Government Agencies Are Destroying Democracy, and he's also the editor-in-chief at truthdig.com. Uh, welcome to the soapbox, Robert. Great. Hi. Okay, so... Uh, I'm also a professor at the University of Southern California, so I do all of that. Okay. So go on. Thank you. Yes, I apologize for not including that. Um, okay, so let's let's talk about. I mean, just a, a basic question that you uh, that that might come up with, say, uh, the average American citizen when they encounter the title of your book, let alone the content of your book. Hopefully, not so much the content of your book, but they know everything about us. Why? What's the big deal? Why is that such a bad thing? Don't we need them to know this information to help protect us? You know, Edward Snowden gave a great answer to that. Uh, he's one of the heroes in my book is for revealing the extent of private and government snooping into our lives. Uh, but he said, you know, for people who say, what's the big deal with privacy, it's like people who say, what's the big deal with free speech? And, and you know, yeah, if, if you don't intend to ever say anything that will disturb people of power, particularly in government, then why... You know, free speech doesn't have to be protected. And the whole idea of protecting a zone of privacy, space around the individual, which is enshrined in our Constitution and the Fourth Amendment as clear as it can be. Uh, Justice Roberts, a conservative judge, uh, you know, uh, leading our Supreme Court uh, last uh, year ago, June, uh, in a unanimous uh, decision, said that the police can't crack into your cell phone uh, with, you know, out having a, a, a specific warrant. And he said that the protection of, of this notion of privacy, private space, was the spark that started the American Revolution. Uh, this was when the agents of the king went into people's homes and violated English common law, violated the spirit of the Magna Carta, and came in with without specific warrants, without due process, without you know uh, a specific reason for in, in invading your space. And so, this is as fundamental a freedom as we have. Well, okay, so that that's a really important point. Okay, so at that time. Uh, Americans found the notion that their privacy could be invaded rather noxious. Uh, now we seem to willingly provide our private information and give it up as part of, I guess, our consumer society. Um, what, what changed in our notion of privacy, and what hope do we have if, we, if that is no longer just a, a given value of our society? Well, then maybe we don't have the habits required by a free people. I mean, it's, you can't be assumed that uh, people naturally uh, embrace notions of representative government, individual freedom, limited government, democracy. Uh, these are all um, attitudes and ways of living that have been developed over the centuries of human experience. And uh, if, if it can, it is possible in societies to be so overwhelmed by a notion of consumer sovereignty and uh, consumption and, you know, be so, and sell out and nothing matters and you just want to go along to get along. We have plenty of places in the world where large numbers of people accommodate to authoritarian and even totalitarian regimes. I mean, there are probably a very large number of people in China for example, right now, who are grateful that their government has provided a measure of prosperity and development uh, that seemed out of reach until quite recently. And then when other people come along and say, no, but you need to have individual protections, uh, the right to express yourself, the right to assemble for redress of grievances, a right to due process, the right to a, 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 a judicial system uh, that is transparent, et cetera, et cetera, there are some people who say, no, we have our ways. And then our uh, obligation as a people who embrace freedom uh, is to then become teachers uh, to this world and say, no, even uh, when you think you have a benign government, it can turn on you. Uh, even well-intentioned people can be corrupted by power. After all, 
the people who gave us the Fourth Amendment and the First Amendment and the Fifth Amendment or accepted their inclusion in the Constitution, uh, a notion of division of powers, limited government, checks and balances, all of these notions, the people who were going to be checked and balanced were them. Madison, Jefferson, Hamilton, uh, Washington, they were telling the public, we uh, agree, you have to have your individual freedom protected because we can become like the King of England. We, the people you are electing, can become your enemy. We can do bad things. We have to be checked. Now, after 9-11, with this idiotic uh, hysteria about terrorism, uh, once again an undifferentiated enemy like we had in communism that blots out all thought and, and, and frightens people, we said, oh, we can't have any notion of limited government because we're under attack. Well, the people who enshrine these freedoms in our Constitution were themselves very familiar with attack. They had just come through a revolution. They fully expected the English to return, which they did in 1812. They expected other powers in the world to intrude on them and to try to take away their freedom, and yet they enshrined these notions of limited government and individual freedom. And somehow, after 9-11, we lost all of our sense of history. And we said, no, trust the government. That's, that's one point to make. But another that I think is really critical is most people in this country did not think they were giving up their freedom, uh, their privacy, to government. They thought they were giving it up to private organizations operating in the marketplace. So, for example, right now I'm wearing an Apple Watch, okay? And right now, the Apple Corporation can monitor my blood pressure, you know, my heartbeat. Uh, they can figure out what music I'm listening to, what books am I reading, all of this stuff. Okay, well, I made a, 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 I said you know, about a week ago when I bought my Apple Watch, I think Apple, okay, it's not the same as the police state. Uh, you know, Apple favors encryption. Apple has pushed back against the NSA. I'm not giving a commercial for Apple, but I made a judgment that I could to some degree ju trust this private corporation. What we did not know, and what gives me very serious pause in wearing this watch, is that the until Snowden's revelations that made it so clear you can't disregard it, the U.S. government has no respect for the private sector. It has no respect for my transaction with Google, Facebook, Apple. And they just went in and chopped into their fiber optic cables under the ocean. They went in through back door into their main databases. And the government assumed under the NSA, uh, you know, and, and the CIA and the FBI, uh, that they had the right to intrude on all of these private transactions. Now, the U.S. Constitution is not set up to regulate these private transactions. It's set up to regulate an overuse, overreach of government power. And that's been a big confusion here. And now it's a big problem for these private corporations, as my book details, because while Americans may be willing to have a benign view of their own government, which I think is folly, and, and the very folly that our framers of our Constitution warned against, most people around the world are not willing to accept that bargain. And so it's really hurt Apple and, and, and Google and Facebook's business model as they operate around the world. And that's why they're pushing back. And that's why the U.S. Congress uh, did away with the Patriot Act and we have the Freedom Act, which is a significant improvement, but of course it doesn't go far enough in controlling the government snooping. Well, let me ask you about that, Bob, because, uh, you know, I, I, I have a day job and I haven't been able to, perhaps to follow it as closely as you, but the USA Freedom Act, first of all, it's got one of these laughable names like these these acts so often have um but to me if you know you have said that one of the most important points that snowden edward snowden uh, re revealed to us is that there is effectively no distinction between the public and private sector as you were saying now the usa freedom act says okay the nsa will no longer collect and hold bulk collection data uh, phone collection data it'll now be held by private companies. How is that better 
particularly given the fact that we now know that there is virtually no distinction between private and public? Well, there is a distinction between private and public. It's something that the uh, both the private corporations and the government agencies have tried to obliterate. Uh, but Apple can't arrest me. Google can't break into my home. They have to do it through a marshal or an FBI agent or someone else. They don't collect my taxes. They can't uh, uh, punish me in all of those kind of ways. And we still do have a degree of choice. But not only we, the real pressure on Google and Apple and the reason they're playing, I think, a much better role now that it has been revealed how complicit they were, is they are multinational corporations. They have to operate around the world and service the needs of consumers around the world, whether they live in Greece or they live in China or they live in India or any other place. And so they are... Once they've been exposed, and that is the great achievement of Snowden, he wasn't alone, but he certainly was the most effective. Once these corporations are exposed as having not protected our privacy and our freedom, not been vigilant enough, they are under enormous pressure <coughs> to behave better. And we have some measure of choice. For instance, uh, any time a story comes out, like the FBI has tried to prevent Apple and Google from doing encryption, protecting our emails, protecting our correspondence, protecting our purchases, right? Uh, and, and so uh, if you want to look, and I do think the Freedom Act represents uh, a very substantial improvement over the Patriot Act, and not just in the specifics uh, yes, it is much better to have our data at AT&T or Verizon or someplace, because at least we have a measure of choice. We, we can't fire the NSA. We can decide to go with some other operator. And people around the world can. The three major Internet companies in China are Chinese companies. So they, people there will have a choice. Do I trust my Apple device? Do I trust Google searches? This is a big problem in the European Union. They're pushing back very much on, on say, Google. Uh, do we want these little Google trucks running around Hamburg taking pictures of our houses, or is that just the American CIA taking pictures of our houses? So there is a difference between the private sector and the government sector. Uh, and and uh, you, you're absolutely right. Prior to Snowden, which is why Snowden deserves the Nobel Prize and should certainly be pardoned of any sense of crime, you know, and, and this is a message we have to get across to Democratic as well as Republican politicians, because plenty of Democrats have called him a traitor, including Hillary Clinton. But, but, but the fact is, uh, he exposed to the world that these private companies are under tremendous pressure from the U.S. government. Well, if these private companies are merely under the thumb of U.S government spy agencies, they are not truly multinational corporations. Most of their growth and profit comes from being multinational. And it is a contradiction in terms to say, oh, we, we cooperate with the NSA and we lie to you, uh, but trust us everywhere. People around the world won't trust them, and their business model will collapse. And that happens to be America's major export right now. So my question about the USA Freedom Act is, okay, so there is, you know, there's a distinction between the public and private sector. There's enormous pressure from the public on, on the private sector. So my question to you about the USA Freedom Act is that uh, does it put sufficient safeguards uh, against the, the, the public, against the government accessing that information. I mean, isn't the problem that the information exists and can't the government really just get it if they want it? Okay, look, let's just be clear about one thing. I don't want to exaggerate the significance of, the, of ending the Patriot Act and particularly Provision 215 and the Freedom Act. It, it, the significance in it was largely to my mind, a very big significant thing was that there was pushback. Mm -hmm. That the United States Congress, with a bipartisan vote, huge in the House, mm -hmm. forget the numbers, but 344 to, you know, uh, voted for getting rid of the Patriot Act. So finally, finally, 
the U.S. Congress did what it is mandated to do in our Constitution, which is to make basic decisions about war and peace and national security and protect our, our freedom, be the people's house, the House of Representatives. And finally, they pushed back and said, you know, this hysteria after uh, 9-11, uh, led us down the wrong path. And in fact, the guy, Sensenbrenner, the congressman who wrote the Patriot Act, denounced it and said it was misused, it was distorted. And don't forget, the key provisions of the Patriot Act were interpreted by secret courts. We don't even know what, what spin they, they put on that, that language. Uh, and so this pushback was a very important moment in American history, you know. Uh, that's how history gets made. It's like with the gay marriage uh, the, the, the other day, you know. Sometimes things happen, and, and you know, some people can sit around and say, well, it should have happened a different way, or it's not that big a deal, or it doesn't solve every problem. But then you look back on it, and you say it's like Brown versus Board of Education. Th things happen. And for the U.S. Congress to stand up and say, no, we are not going to, in the name of fighting terrorism, go along with everything you ask for in destroying our basic freedom. That was a big moment. Does it solve all the problems? No. First of all, it only dealt with mass data collection of the kind that, you know, Article 215 seemed to, to sanction. There are many issues involved in the surveillance state, the access to information, whether it's, you know, listening to this phone conversation, <laughs> if it were a private conversation, or following our data. And you're absolutely right. The question is, how well will these private companies push back? And that really goes back to consumers. If, if consumers, and not just consumers in the United States, but around the world, start demanding privacy protection as part of the product, no, we don't want uh, any intelligence. First of all, we're not just dealing with U.S. intelligence agencies. Uh, you know, uh, any government in the world now has license to do what the U.S. government has set a standard on. How do we tell the Chinese, no, you can't invade American companies, you can't invade American machines and phones and everything, when we do it routinely? We said we had the right, right, to, our government had the right to tap into Angela Merkel, the leader of Germany's, phone, the leader of Brazil's phone. So, so where is the international standard protecting individual freedom? And we're supposed to be that city on the hill, to use Ronald Reagan's phrase. We're supposed to be educating the world to the needs of limited government and individual freedom. We have now set this terrible standard for invading everyone in the world's privacy, okay? Now, now, well, first of all, let me just answer your first question in this context. You know, the whole reason we have this Fourth Amendment, and this was laid out very clearly in the Roberts Court, is you, if you are going to be a free people, you have to be, have space where you can think thoughts, read books, have conversations that people in power might find troubling. They might not want you to have those conversations, read those books, have those thoughts. But that is the essence of freedom. It's space to think, to ruminate, to investigate, to consult before you go out and redress your grievances. That was the whole notion of, 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 of freedom going back to the Magna Carta, but you can trace it back to Aristotle and what have you. I mean, it's a it's an old notion of where do thoughts come from? Where does dialogue come from? Uh, where does independence of thought come from? You know, when we talk about freedom, we're not talking about those those uh, women in, in uh, Iraq holding up their purple ink-stained fingers, you know, and saying, oh, I voted the way the Ayatollah told me to vote. That's not what we consider freedom. We consider freedom informed public, you know, that knows what's going on, what's being done in its name, and can challenge. And that requires privacy, okay? And we haven't solved that problem if the government can crack into your phones, if they can listen to everything, if they can grab all this data. So you're right. We have to have a battle over the, our right to have encryption. Uh, they should have to have a specific court order if they want to look at your uh, emails, uh, if they want to, any of your correspondence. Uh, and these are big battlegrounds. So, yes, the Freedom Act does not answer all of those questions. It's just the opening, opening salvo.
Thank you.